there from free and easy to guided discussion in one short, sweet sentence. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the National Association of Scholars Great American Literature webinar series, and in particular, our discussion of Ernest Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises. I am delighted to have here three distinguished scholars to discuss this novel. They are Dr. James Nagel, who is Ibsen Distinguished Professor Emeritus at the University of Georgia, you know, and until recently a resident scholar at Dartmouth College. Among his very many books are your Hemingway in Love and War and Hemingway, The Oak Park Legacy. Dr. Kirk Kernut is professor and chair of English at Troy University's Montgomery campus. Among his books are uh, Ernest Hemingway and the Expatriate Modernist Movement, Coffee with Hemingway, and a forthcoming, A Reader's Guide to Hemingway's To Have and Have Not. Dr. Jerry Kennedy is Boyd Professor of English at Louisiana State University, also a very distinguished publication record, uh, including among other things, we're not, we're going to have a name which is not Ernest Hemingway, Strange Nation, Literary Nationalism and Cultural Conflict in the Age of Poe. And I'm going to say, <laughs> I'm not mentioning everybody's book because their name, the titles of these books and their links ought to be appearing shortly in the chat button um, at the bottom of your screen so that you can go purchase uh, every book that, that any of our uh, panelists has ever written um, from Amazon. So in, anyway, I encourage everybody to do this as soon as humanly possible. Oh, and hmm, I was gonna do this myself, but I can't quite figure out how to get this done properly. <laughs> oh, it's already been done, lovely. Okay, um, sorry, a brief interruptions there. We are going to be having 12 to 14 minutes talk a piece from each of our three panelists uh, in alphabetical order by last name. This will then be followed by you, the audience, putting in your questions into the chat or question and answer buttons um, at the bottom of the screen. I then convey them, or they can be read by the panelists, or uh, the panelists can simply talk to one another. It's all free and easy and conversational. If your question does not get answered, and I just choose them in whatever order seems conversational, don't worry. Send me email at randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L -L at nas.org, and I'll be delighted to convey your questions uh, to the professors later so they can have the option of responding to you. <clears throat> also, don't worry if you have to leave partway through. This will be recorded and on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours. Having said all that, um, Professor Kernet, may I ask if you would go first? Sure, I'd be happy to. And I just want to say thank you for having me today. And it's an honor to appear both with uh, Professors Kennedy and Nagel, who are good friends and more importantly, major mentors of mine. I did my studies with Dr. Kennedy longer than we would probably like to acknowledge. And uh, Professor Nagel and I do a lot of work together these days as well and have long been aware of their uh, influence and productivity. So it's an honor for me to be here. I thought I would, what I would do is just open in a general way and talk a little bit about uh, the relationship of The Sun Also Rises with this category of the great American novel that we have. And to ask, uh, you know, how does it fit into that that group of novels and how, do, how does it stand out perhaps? It's a topic that I uh, am have been studying in a recent years because I co-host a podcast called Great American Novels in which Scott Yarbo and I discuss uh, a book and episode and kind of go through the uh, history of the canonicity of these different books. That was a very blatant plug, so please forgive me. But uh, that term mm -hmm. itself, the Great American Novel, as many people know, was coined in 1868 as really as a way to sort of generate a conversation about whether uh, the uh, uh, whether American literature would be able to produce a national literature and not be uh, reliant on imitative models of uh, British literature. Uh, and the gentleman that coined it, J.W. DeForest, uh, defined it as a picture of American life 
uh, drawn with a f uh, with a few passionate strokes. So clearly left a lot wide open there. But if we take each of those three terms of the great American novel, it's really in a lot of different ways, highly contested, all three of them. In Hemingway's case, obviously there's no argument that it's a novel. Uh, that's not necessarily the case in other books, um, but it, it's it's striking to me the uh, importance that we invest in American literature in the novel, as opposed to it, it excludes a lot, including the short story, including theater, including poetry. Um, and in Hemingway studies, it's it's especially interesting that a lot of effort goes into, I think, denying that his first quote unquote novel, which was The Torrance of Spring, is a novel. It's You often see it described as a satire, and there's a huge debate when we go to proofread or copy edit any kind of text surrounding mm -hmm. Hemingway. Do we really want to call The Torrance of Spring his first novel? Uh, saving that sort of idea of a debut for uh, The Sun Also Rises. Importantly, The Sun Also Rises was written first, but it was published after The Torrance of Spring. The two other terms in Great American Novel are really the most problematic, and and the notion of great uh, mm -hmm. is the idea that the these novels should have some sort of ambition, should have some sort of size that uh, is commensurate with the uh, continent itself. And in Hemingway's case, it's arguable that maybe he doesn't quite fit this uh, for the very obvious reason that uh, his his greatest influence was in the direction of minimalism as opposed to the maximalism that we might associate with, say, Thomas Pynchon's Gravity Rainbow or John Steinbeck's um, The Grapes of Wrath. So in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, just the, the, the stylistic scope and the experimentation, sometimes I think The Sun Also Rises gets a little short shrift not unlike The Great Gatsby, which is maybe the great American novel that it's 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 most akin to in this area. But the really problematic one is this idea of America and that uh, in a very basic way, this notion of the great American novel asks the question, can there be a great American novel that is not set in America? And um, we should note that uh, the two worst works in the Hemingway uh, bibliography uh, are both the ones that he set in uh, in the United States, and that's the novels that that is the Torrance of Spring and To Have and Have Not. So we're dealing with a lot of uh, problematic issues here. People might think, well, Henry James, you know, certainly uh, you know promoted the uh, the the uh, American theme, the innocence abroad theme. Uh, but in Hemingway's case, I think the use of that is a is a is a little different. And I should note that when we talk about great American novels or Gans, as uh, as uh, Hemingway himself per or Henry James preferred to call them, most of that discussion actually centers on the Bostonians as opposed to any of the works that are set abroad. I should note that in uh, Lawrence Buell's uh, The Dream of the Great American Novel. The Sun Also Rises is mentioned exactly once on page nine as a way of saying, I'm not going to be talking about this book, but I will be talking about Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and uh, Beloved and and uh, a whole host of ones. So it's really difficult, I think, to find uh, we have to bend this notion of the great American novel and go against our instincts a little bit to uh, to include it, certainly in terms of influence, in terms of uh, the thematic importance of the novel. Uh, it, it deserves to be canonical, uh, I think, arguably for most people. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of which is Hemingway's best novel kind of rotates a little bit between The Sun Also Rises and uh, maybe A Farewell to Arms. Um, I think Dr. Kennedy will talk about the fact that maybe his best work uh, is uh, the short story collection In Our Time. That's certainly the most experimental of his uh, of his efforts. So Hemingway does and doesn't sit in this paradigm of the great American novel very comfortably. I would suggest one way to think of this as a great American novel, and one of the reasons for its enduring appeal, is that it is a, it is a book that's about the search for values. It's about the interrogation of values, and um, 
typically in a great American novel, we go to one of two extremes in terms of our form or structure. We either have a quest novel, mm -hmm. which is kind of drawn out of the, uh, you know, the, the mythic tradition, the quest for the Holy Grail, some sort of series of challenges to a protagonist that uh, brings them to a significant moment in their moral and uh, emotional development. Or we have a picaresque, which is a term that refers to novels that are more about kind of rambling. I think the canonical, the textbook case of that is probably Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Um, in Hemingway's case, I think The Sun Also Rises kind of sits right between the two of those because we have a group of protagonists that, um, that are in search of something as they uh, travel uh, into Spain and uh, immerse themselves in this uh, very uh, historical, traditional uh, Spanish uh, pageantry. Um, but they don't necessarily know or do, they don't necessarily think of themselves on a quest. And a lot of the controversy around the novel surrounds the fact that this is a novel uh, that involves a massive amount of, uh, of drinking. But it is an interrogation of, of American Puritanism and American morals as they stood in the early 1920s. One of the things that I like to do when I teach this book is have students read uh, different entries in Harold E. Stern's Civilization in the, in the United States, which was kind of a, um, a severe critique of the state of American culture in the early 1920s. And it's a good connection because Harold Stern's actually shows up in The Sun Also, also Rises as the character Harvey Stone, who's maybe most famous for collecting the coasters at the select bar. Uh, but it dramatizes just the artistic sense that American Puritanism did not allow for much of the experimentation or the creative growth that modernist literature was in a, in a more global sense was demanding by the early 1920s with uh, the influence of James, jo James Joyce's Ulysses and uh, you know, encyclopedic works like that. Um, so, you know, the way we traditionally think of Hemingway, I think, is this idea, of, uh, even though he uh, kind of falls after this a little bit, but he's certainly typical of what uh, at the time was called the revolt from the village or the revolt from the provincial suburbs of, of an upbringing. And um, the, the search in the larger world for something to define one's identity in a way that can transcend the limits of being uh, an American. And I think for Hemingway's generation, having many of them having been touched by World War I, the obvious field of play to find those sorts of values was a return to Europe, and in particular, a return to um, France and to Paris, where they were able to immerse themselves in artistic cultures, but also to, to survey more, maybe more immediately the wreckage of, uh, of the First World War. The Sun Also Rises is a novel that one of its central themes is moral economics. And a good friend of the three of us who passed away about a year ago named Scott Donaldson had a, a, wrote a wonderful essay that I think is probably the quintessential essay about this particular theme called the uh, morality of compensation. And it's simply the, the idea that for everything sold, something must be purchased. For everything expended, something must be lost. Uh, and in a very real way, the, the, the sun also rises is about moral and fiscal responsibility, and it weaves those two ideas together. It's one of the rare novels that I can think of where one of the central symbolic scenes involves uh, the protagonist balancing his checkbook. But that's a very important moment for Jake Barnes because it dramatizes his, uh, his basic idea in work and the value of work and the idea of earning. And Jake is, of course, um, sort of surrounded by what are usually called waste rolls or one uh, wastelanders, a group of uh, drinking drinkers that skimp out on their bills that are uh, 
just simply um, uh, uh, prodigal in both their emotional and their uh, financial responsibilities. So that's maybe one of the core themes we can come back to in our in our discussion of the novel. I would simply wrap up my time by adding as well that I think part of the importance of the sun also rises and it's it's uh, maybe a underappreciated aspect of the great American novel is it's a it's a generational creed to care. In other words, uh, great American novels arise, often arise out of the idea of a new generation wanting or needing to define its own literary path in life. And that's certainly true for the writers of the 1920s. And it's very important that this book begins with one of the most famous epigraphs in American literature, which in part comes from Gertrude Stein, uh, a line that Hemingway would later claim to be ironic, but I don't think actually is and hence in in the way that he meant it when he was writing it and that's you are all a lost generation so this side of paradise has set the template for generational novels and um nobody in their 20s or early 30s really feels like they found their path in life and if they did find their path in life there's no plot so the this this idea of uh challenging inherited values and the search for uh uh new forms of meaning, I think, makes the novel uh, a great American novel. So with that, I'll simply wrap up and then uh, listen to what my colleagues have to say. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, Professor Kennedy, may I ask if you would go next? Uh, I'd be glad to, David. And thanks for uh, thanks for moderating. Great to see uh, Kirk and Jim, at least virtually. And uh, all of us have been longtime members of the Hemingway Society and have known each other for years and years and years. So it's a great kick to uh, get together with them. Um, I, I will obviously repeat a few things that, or touch on some things that Kirk mentioned. Uh, but one thing I, I want to uh, focus on is the way that the sun also rises um, was really uh, a kind of explosive uh, publication for Hemingway in the sense that um, in the space of two years, roughly from 1924 to 1926, he went from being a writer that really only a few people knew about to a writer that everyone was talking about. And it's no exaggeration to say that The Sun Also Rises was a cult novel in the 1920s that produced uh, uh, a certain fixation on fashions, on dressing like Brett. Uh, it also turned Pamplona uh, into a great uh, American expatriate uh, pilgrimage site, which it had not been at all before that. Uh, now, if you go today, you'll see a, a memorial there to Ernest Hemingway. I think it's sort of a mixed uh, tribute. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the origins of this novel and um, uh, and the um, the context in which it was written. Kirk mentioned the 20s, and I have a few things to say about that too. But I want to talk about the geographical context as well, and specifically the framing Paris, Pamplona, with that interval at the Arati River in between. Uh, and I think there is significance in that geography and one that I think very intimately connects uh, this novel, The Sun Also Rises, with the book that Hemingway had just finished writing, which is this one, uh, which Kirk, thank you for, uh, the check is in the mail, uh, for in, on CNN, everybody has their book in the background, but uh, <laughs> I don't have a shelf. Anyway, uh, I was delighted to edit in our time for Norton for the new critical edition. There's a new critical edition by Michael Thurston of The Sun Also Rises. I see you have that as well. And the connection between these books is uh, a, a lot more intimate than I, I really realized uh, before I started preparing for this because um, obviously, as you read through in our time, you see Hemingway loading the book up with uh, 
vignettes, uh, chapters on bullfighting. Uh, he began to go to bullfights in 1923. By 1925, when he was in Pamplona, that was his third summer uh, of going to the bullfights. And uh, in fact, one of the vignettes in The Sun Also Rises is clearly set in Pamplona because it has the Riau Rau dancers and uh, evokes the sort of frenzied atmosphere that is at the heart of the Pamplona section of the novel. Um, <clears throat> the novel begins, of course, in Paris, and um, the significance there, I think, is that uh, Paris was well known already uh, when Hemingway took off in uh, very late 1921 to make his way to Paris and to set himself up there as a journalist and uh, an apprentice writer. Um, but uh, while he was in Paris, uh, he was mostly working for the Toronto Star. He was uh, writing, he began writing short pieces in 1923. Uh, there's only one early story, uh, My Old Man, uh, that actually made its way into uh, this uh, in our time. And uh, so that entire book in our time was was being written in 1923, 1924. Uh, and uh, Hemingway's activity uh, uh, in that novel uh, has has really kind of three centers. One of them uh, is the world he left behind, Michigan, the world of trout streams and forests and so forth. And I would say that that world in its own way is intimately evoked in the Arati section of The Sun Also Rises. And there's a reason for that connection. It's not accidental. The, uh, the prototype for the character of Bill Gorton was Bill Smith. You could say it was Bill Smith and Donald Ogden Stewart sort of fused together as one character, but Bill Smith was the guy that Hemingway fished with in Michigan. And there are two or three stories in, uh, in our time where Hemingway is with Bill Smith. And the one that, that uh, just sort of knocked me out was uh, the, the, the story um, Three Day Blow, which is about a couple of guys getting drunk and just going on and on about a whole range of different things in a pretty disconnected, drunken uh, kind of dialogue. Uh, we get to the Arati section and here's Hemingway and his European version of Bill Smith going out on the Arati River and catching trout and just going into a crazy conversation that sort of accidentally touches on most of the main themes uh, that the novel is about. It touches on the problem of Jake's impotence, uh, his war wound, his inability uh, to ever satisfy Brett. Uh, it touches on uh, the problem of prohibition, uh, the saloon, anti-saloon league uh, that is evoked. And um, of course, as Kirk mentioned, there is a prodigious amount of drinking in this novel. I, was rereading the last section this morning and noticed that um, Jake uh, has is having lunch at Botan's in Madrid and he has three bottles of red wine for lunch. <laughs> and then he and Brett decide to knock off two more. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's, that's a lot of wine for lunch. Anyway, um, so uh, Hemingway is, is um, opening up these, these uh, storylines in uh, The Sun Also Rises. And of course, the, the Paris storyline is already there in, in our time in the Mr. and Mrs. Elliot story that is briefly set in Paris cafes and evokes the career of a, a not very good expatriate poet. Um, and it's, it's also there, my old man sitting at uh, uh, a cafe right beside the, uh, on the Place de l'Opéra. Uh, and then you have the, uh, the, the bullfight section, uh, the, the bullfight chapters of uh, In Our Time that uh, lead directly toward the, the big focus 
uh, in The Sun Also Rises, the geography that leads us from Paris and uh, the, the jaded, bored, uh, sort of drifting existence of the expatriates in Paris who mostly get drunk. Uh, they almost always travel in circles. Uh, and uh, we have the beginning of that theme of values and the related theme, how do you live your life fully? That comes up in the first section, the Paris section of the novel, when Robert Cohn has the idea of going off to South America. Um, but the novel is set up to lead us from this, this place of, of uh, alienation, disaffection, confusion, boredom, southward, through the mountains, through uh, really an iconic, uh, memorable landscape. Uh, our dear departed friend, Stoney Stoneback would remind us that uh, we're in Chanson de Roland country uh, when we go through the uh, the town of Ranceva. Uh, and it leads finally to Pamplona, uh, to a great uh, religious festival of Saint Fermin uh, that also has bullfighting built into it. And uh, it's, it's so clear that, that, I mean, Hemingway structures the novel so that everything builds to the last a uh, really powerful bull that Pedro Romero fights in the bull ring, where he shows us that greatness, where he has that purity of form uh, uh, with the maximum of exposure. Um, in 1923, Hemingway wrote a letter uh, to his friend Bill Horn, who had driven an ambulance in Italy with him. And uh, he, he said to him, uh, he was telling him about how great the bullfights are. You have to come over here and see them. He said, it's just like having a ringside seat at the war with nothing going to happen to you. And I, I, I mean, it, I, you could make the argument and it would take me an hour to make it, so I won't make it, but that, that, that really explains the structure of this novel, the search for an, a, a way out of the trauma uh, the depression, the misery uh, that has been left by the Great War. There is something in bullfighting that Jake sees uh, in the way the, the really great uh, bullfighter is able to uh, face death and to control the moment. Uh, there's a kind of brilliance in that, a meaning. It's a, it's a hugely archetypal uh, kind of uh, structure that, that Hemingway is, is playing with here. Uh, we could say that the, the whole Pamplona section is a kind of Dionysian ritual and, and the dancing in the streets, the incessant drinking and so forth, uh, really underscore the way that the, this is a, yes, it's a, a folk festival, uh, but it's also a, a kind of mythic event. Uh, and it has to do with how human beings face the problem of death. What are we to do in the face of that gigantic existential problem, which for everyone in this generation seemed to be so profound uh, and so inescapable uh, because uh, as we see at the very beginning of the novel, when Jake gets into that cab with Georgette and she tries to touch him and he has to explain now, <laughs> Uh, we're not going to go there. Uh, I, I'm sick of the war. Everybody's sick of the war, blah, blah, blah. And that is, I, I mean, Hemingway touches on the war briefly here and there and there. He reminds us that dinner one night is like the dinners you had during a war when there was a, a certain tension in the air. Uh, but going to Pamplona is, is about going back to find some kind of catharsis. Uh, for the feeling of loss that the experience of war has created. And it's really, I think, one of the reasons why this novel connected with so many people and made Hemingway almost instantly such a hugely popular author. So I'm going to stop with that.
Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, we're going to go to the third of our panelists now, Professor Nagel. Thank you. Uh, before I go on to uh, my major issues, I'd like to add something to uh, Kirk's uh, very interesting discussion of uh, the novel as, as part of the great American uh, novel tradition. I think there's a theme in uh, The Sun Also Rises that uh, it does make it really great. And that central theme is uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> Jake was wounded in World War I at least eight years ago, and he has not recovered from it yet at all. He's still dealing with the depression that resulted uh, from his wounds. He cries in his room uh, when he's alone. He's in deep trouble psychologically, and it all started with his wounding in the, in the war. That's a theme, that's a concept that is contemporary in American life, not only from the Vietnam War, but from the Mideast Wars, uh, we're aware of the psychological consequences of uh, conflict of, of that sort. And uh, Hemingway is the first to put a stress on that particular concept. I'd like to talk a bit about the narrative method of the novel, uh, because I have a point to make about it that I think is uh, nearly always lost in scholarship. Uh, by the 1920s, there were three, two dominant ways of telling a novel. One was third person, that is, nearly always an omniscient uh, narrator who knows the story and can tell you whatever he chooses uh, about it. The virtue of third person is simultaneity. That is, you have the sense that events are told as they happen. And you're right there watching them as though you're watching a movie. And, um, uh, that is a, a, a popular way of doing it. Hemingway was not particularly good at third person. He tried a lot of third person approaches to things. He nearly always abandoned them. Uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls begins as a third person novel, but it stops after a while. And I think the best part of that novel is in first person when Pilar tells about the taking of the fascist village. That's about a 50 page uh, line of dialogue in first person and it is immediate and it is brilliant. It's just uh, wonderful. The other approach is first person. Someone talks about what happened to them and what they observed and so forth. First person narration in fiction nearly always has a double time scheme. That is, there is the time of the telling and there is the time of the action. Those two times can have rather different values. Let me digress and illustrate what I mean. I once had an Irish setter named Patrick, who was a beautiful dog. I loved him and he was my buddy. We were together all the time. And every time I'd come home from the university, we'd go for a walk through the woods and he would run like crazy and jump over logs and he'd be so excited to be out in the woods. And we'd do that for an hour or so. And then we'd come back to my study and I'd be working at my desk or reading and he would be on the floor sleeping or quite often he'd put his head on my foot if I had it sticking out. And we were good buddies and it's great to remember those times. Now, if I tell you he was hit by a car and killed, all of a sudden there's a second another totally different value to the story, one filled with nostalgia and longing and sadness that were not part of the, uh, the first story I told you. First person narration often has different values at the time of the telling from the time of the action. That is true of The Sun Also Rises. My key point 
is that when Jake Barnes tells the first page of this novel, all of the events have already taken place. When he tells the first page, Brett has already run off with Robert down to the coast. She's already had the affair with Pedro Romero, rejected Pedro, called on Jake for help. Uh, Robert has already knocked Jake out in a fight in Pamplona. He's run off with Brett. And that is part of why I think in the early Paris section, Jake makes such a fool out of Robert. He's bitter about what has happened. Jake's emphasis is on what a schlemiel Robert is. <laughs> but in fact, Robert and Jake were quite good friends. They played tennis together regularly. Robert obviously feels very comfortable coming to Jake's office and sleeping on his sofa. You don't do that with someone you hardly know. That's the kind of thing you do with your best buddy. And um, I think they were quite good friends at the beginning. Uh, well, Jake has lost a lot in this novel. He's lost his friendship with Robert. He's lost his uh, relationship with Brett, which at least has been further compromised than it already is. He lost his friendship with Montoya and his standing in the aficionado club of Pamplona. He can't go back there. He introduced Pedro Romero to Brett, and that destroyed him. Uh, there's no way Montoya is going to welcome him to his hotel next year when uh, he comes. Um, uh, this is a novel about loss, and Jake knows at the beginning that he has lost it all. Uh, the virtue of third-person narration is simultaneity. Things are happening as they're told, or they're told as they are happening. The virtue of first-person narration with a double time scheme is the awareness of the double values that are there. Uh, from the point of view of Jake's loss, the attempts at having fun and celebrating at the fiesta are pretty desperate. Uh, it is not simple fun. It is destructive fun. And uh, they drink too much. They have too much sex. They're too, they're, they've lost their central core of values. And um, uh, it doesn't end up well at all. At the end of the novel, Jake still has uh, his role as a journalist. That's not been compromised too badly. He still has a friendship with Bill, uh, which goes way back, of course. Uh, but he's further compromised his relationship with Brett, and I think that meant everything to him. Uh, that accounts for the bitter tone of the novel. When Brett says, we could have had such a great life together, Jake says, isn't it pretty to think so? Uh, I think he's pretty uh, bitter at the end. Jake's psychological state throughout the novel is one of loss and depression. Uh, he tries to hide it in the celebration, but it doesn't really work. And now he's looking, and now all of that has happened. He's looking back on it and telling about the events that took place when he lost all of these things that were so important to him. And that's my take of the novel. Thank you so much. Thank you all three so much. Now I am going to once more advertise questions, put them into chat and or Q and A at the bottom. I'll be glad to <clears> convey them. I'll start off with yeah, maybe an old fashioned question by now. Um, prose style. Uh, once upon a time, there were claims that Hemingway was a great revolutionary of the prose style, helps invent modernism. This is part of his claim to greatness. 
Uh, one, is this still a, well, is this a true claim? Two, does it apply to the greatness of the sun also rises? And three, are, are is, is that actually so evident? I mean, do people, are, are people still making the claim about his prose style in 2022 uh, the way they did well when I was learning this a few decades ago? To any and all. I would just jump in very quickly and say, yes, uh, he is still recognized for creating uh, the minimalist style, uh, the, the brevity, the radical excision of uh, what he would later call scroll work or ornament. It may be not be as, I think because of the first person narration, it may not be quite as obvious in The Sun Also Rises as it is in perhaps the stories in, in our time and in particularly in the vignettes that Jerry was talking about. But I think you, I think you can't deny that his his style was so infectious that it was almost impossible for him for subsequent writers in the late twenties and thirties to not somehow imitate him. And the key word is hard boiled. Um, you know, that that's an expression that, uh, you know, pops up in this novel. Uh, but it became, it, it became associated with the sort of emotional re repression and inability to express those, uh, emotions. I think it stereotyped Hemingway for a long time. You know, he, his style was never <laughs> quite as radically minimalist as af in from the 1930s on as it was in the 20s um but certainly i think if you look at the the emphasis on symbolism throughout the novel which is something that he absolutely as a literary technique denied using but it's there you know there's that idea that the meaning is projected out onto objects and into the environment uh, as opposed to the you know sort of the grandiloquent Victorian way of expressing or explaining everything with the obtrusive narrator that Jim was discussing. So in short, yes, he is the inventor of a radical style. He was influenced by Gertrude Stein and Ezra Pound and to a lesser extent Sherwood Anderson, but he made it his own and he made it, a, a, again, a generational thing. I'd also I, say... Uh, go ahead, Jerry. All right. Uh, well, I would say that, you know, there are many prose styles in The Sun Also Rises. Uh, I can, well, I can identify three that are quite distinct. Um, one is one is the um, uh, sort of the spectatorial style that we get, especially when Hemingway is describing country. Uh, he was very self-conscious about um, uh, trying to create a literary uh, picture, a landscape that was somehow reminiscent of Cezanne. And he tells us, and the sun also rises, he's also reading Turgenev's sportsman sketches and loves the way that Turgenev did country. Um, then there's the, uh, as Kirk was mentioning, the, the very ironic use of objects to tell us things. And one great moment where that works brilliantly is the scene in the cafe where uh, Jake has been sitting with Brett uh, and maybe Bill, if I recall, having, having a drink or having coffee and Romero comes over to the table. No, it's Romero that joins Jake and Brett and the three of them have coffee and then after he leaves, Romero and, and uh, Brett have liqueur. And so when Jake comes back, he sees the three cups that they had uh, drinking coffee and then the two glasses that signify the way that he has set up Romero. And he's very much aware of the stares of Montoya and the other bullfight enthusiasts in the room. So that's, to me, that is a, a kind of a gem moment when uh, Jake is just looking at those glasses on the table and allowing us to read what he is reading in them. The, the third style is the, the kind of weird, uh, almost surreal stream of consciousness stuff that seeps into the novel at different moments. Um, there's a little bit of that in the Paris section where Jake is uh, uh, looking at himself in the mirror and uh, uh, he later 
confesses that things are a lot harder in at night. Um, but there's also that that wonderful sequence uh, when he's feeling rotten in Pamplona, and he imagines he's lugging a suitcase around. He talks about his invisible suitcase. Mm -hmm. I carried it up the steps. I put it down. Of course, there's no suitcase there, but it it's a way of of uh, talking about how overwhelmed he is by everything he carries every day. So anyway. Uh, my sense is that <laughs> Hemingway uh, did not exactly invent uh, the style that he writes in, but he perfected it. Um, I, I look at things this way. In the first half of the 19th century, the style of American literature was university educated. It was an elevated style. It used a lexicon that was quite beyond the language of ordinary people living in the villages and towns of, of America. Uh, Hawthorne and Melville and Thoreau and Emerson uh, exemplify this kind of style. By the end of the century, Writers were coming in and writing in the language of common people, the language that common people use every day, Stephen Crane and Kate Chopin, and particularly Grace King uh, wrote in that uh, style. And uh, Hemingway mm -hmm. picked it up and I think just perfected it as an art form. It's very hard to improve on Hemingway's sentences. I would sometimes give a class uh, a paragraph of Hemingway and say, all right, make it better. <laughs> and uh, I'll give you uh, 20 minutes to make it better, even just make one sentence better, and we'll come back and hear from you about that. It is really hard <laughs> to improve on what Hemingway is, is, is doing. <laughs> so um, I think his style had an enormous amount of uh, uh, influence. Of course, Susan Minot writes in a style that is almost identical to Hemingway's. And she's a wonderful writer. And, uh, but very few uh, writers have been able to sustain uh, the beauty of uh, simple style. You don't have to have a dictionary to look up any words when you read Hemingway. Everything he says, every, la every word he uses is used in common everyday speech. And he made art out of our common language. I would just add that Joan Didion was also deeply influenced by uh, Hemingway. And I, I certainly have always thought of play it as a lays, as a, as a kind of... Uh, uh, women's version of the sun also rises set in set in Hollywood as opposed to uh, as opposed to Paris and Pamplona. Hmm. Interesting. You make me want to read, by the way, any paragraphs which were improved from Hemingway, <laughs> uh, if you were ever able to get that. I'm going to go to a question from Tom Mann. Uh, what is your take on the changes made to the punctuation of the novel's last line? Is it much ado about nothing? And I want you please to explain to the audience, what are the changes made to the punctuation of the novel's last line? And why does it matter? Tenny and all. Well, I would just say that uh, the, the person that made those changes is our good friend, Robert Trogdon, who's... Uh, editor of the uh, Library of America edition of The Sun Also Rises. And uh, I, I think they, you know, traditionally the novel ends with a, a question mark. And I think turning that into a uh, period just makes that last sentence all the more poignant. Um, you know, Jake is not asking a rhetorical question anymore. <laughs> uh, he is uh, just sort of throwing it out ironically. Um, uh, and you know, that's, uh, those changes of punctuation can sometimes seem like you're dancing on the head of a pen, but I do think they are very important. The, the, the sort of equivalent that happened is, uh, F, F. Scott Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise, which in draft form originally ended with a dash as opposed to a period. And somebody in the production process there changed that to a period. And for 
70, 80 years, it was that way. And then you read it with a dash and it's so much more open-ended. So I think it does have a, a, a very definitive effect on it. There were, of course, a lot of changes to Hemingway's prose that he didn't participate in. Uh, publishers in the 1920s felt uh, they had the liberty to have their editorial people improve on what uh, their writers had, had written. And that's always a, a difficult point in, in discussing what Hemingway did. And uh, you don't know if he did it or if uh, the manuscripts help some, but sometimes those questions are not answered. But I think Kirk makes a, a great point. That is, if, if, there, if there's a question mark at the end, it's possible to say, well, things are not really all that bad. Uh, if there's a period at the end of it, it seems to me a much more bitter conclusion about how everything has gone badly and it's beyond repair. Yeah, I think there's a, a scene fairly close to the end of The Sun Also Rises where um, Jake has just received a telegram from Brett, Brett uh, in Madrid where she says she's rather in trouble. And it, it causes him to think about uh, his relationship to her uh, and how you um, uh, see her with one man and then introduce her to another uh, and she gets in trouble, she says, and you write her a telegram and sign it, love, Jake. Uh, and it, it, it sort of sums up the, this uh, kind of absurdist view of himself of, of, uh, or, you know, deeply skeptical uh, sense of uh, the life that he now must live. And uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Brett has helped him see by admitting she knows she couldn't live with uh, uh, Romero. She couldn't live with any man. And I think Jake understands in that that whatever they might have had uh, is, is just a pretty idea. Thank you. I'm going to go to a different question from Gary and push it a little, I think. How much of the novel mirrors Hemingway's life, if any? And I'm going to add, you know, push that a bit. Where is there particular artistry in mirroring Hemingway's life? Where is there particular artistry in departing from his life? Well, I think it's I think it's undeniable that part of the original appeal of the novel was both in the idea that it was a generational novel, but also that it was a Roman à clay. And, you know, from the minute it came out, the papers in Paris, American papers in Paris were sort of reporting upon, you know, how Hemingway was uh, writing about real life people. Um you know, I think it's a I think it's a tough question to answer because undeniably a lot of the appeal of the sun also rises is knowing or learning about the people that inspired it. And then it's, you know, there've been decade long, decades long hunts to, you know, learn more about Duff Twisden, who was the uh, uh, the woman that uh, that uh, Lady Brett was based on, and even minor characters like Pat Guthrie, uh, who was the inspiration for for Mike Campbell. Um, you know, one of the ironies of the the growth of the novel from manuscript to finished product is uh, Jake was originally Ham. There was also Hadley, who was a character, his first wife, and she sort of unceremoniously disappeared as the first draft was being written. Um, all writers start with personal experience. I mean, there's there's always some undeniable element. I think sometimes Hemingway doesn't get enough credit for the invention that happens in that transformation from uh, real life into fiction. And I would simply hazard a guess that probably the people that um, inspired this novel were maybe um, a little less interesting than they are as fictional characters. Uh, we haven't really talked about Lady Brett, but you know, she's shattered by the war too. She's a, 
you know, she's suffering from her own PTSD. And I think that gives these characters uh, 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 maybe a more mythic quality than, um, than, than the real life folks might have had. Um, you know, the, the drawback of that is people can always say, well, you're just writing about what happened to you. And that was a common knock on Hemingway. Uh, it was also a common knock on F. Scott Fitzgerald. But I also think that, you know, real life experience is sort of the the headwaters of literary inspiration. And, you know, you 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 have to start somewhere. So I don't think the real life uh, background has to overwhelm the novel. Um, I think you can look at the symbolism and the experience just to go back to the fishing expedition in real life the fishing was horrible that particular week they went and instead Hemingway makes it a much more interesting sort of symbolic uh experience and fishtails getting improved is also part of real life in America right yeah. We should also well, mention that Hemingway did not lose his genitalia. So, you know, you know there's a point there where uh, maybe the most, uh, you know, important thematic quality to Jake Barnes is a literary invention. It yeah. is interesting that Harold Loeb, who was the um, prototype of uh, Robert Cohn, uh, wrote a book about what really happened in Pamplona. And uh, that's very interesting. I mean, his, his general take on it is that he and Hemingway were very close friends, and he was astonished at the portrait of Robert Cohn when it finally came out, especially really kind of the anti-Semitism that comes out of it. Uh, that was not part of Hemingway's uh, life uh, with Harold at all. But he recounts when they got into an argument in Pamplona he had run off with Lady Duff Twisden to the coast, the way Robert does with uh, Brett. And Hemingway seemed quite possessive about uh, Lady Duff and was taking issue with it and challenged uh, Harold to go out outside and fight. So they walked outside of the, the bar and they're standing out in the alley and uh, Hemingway's looking at Harold and uh, Harold says, well, uh, let's get it on. And Hemingway says, you still have your glasses on. Oh, so <laughs> Loeb takes off his glasses. And now what am I going to do with it? So he puts them in his shirt pocket. And Hemingway says, that's no good. They're going to get broken for sure in your shirt pocket. So he takes them out and says to Hemingway, why are we doing this anyway? And Hemingway said, damned if I know, why don't we go back in and have a drink? And that was the end of, of the confrontation between the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so Hemingway's inventiveness about making it much more dramatic than it really was is, uh, is something. Now, of course, in the first draft, Jake is married and his wife is with him at the fiesta that's a very different circumstance from what we read in the novel and in the revision of the by the time you get to the second draft of the novel uh hadley has disappeared and uh of course in that first draft jake is called hem and uh hadley is called had or kitten and they're using the real names that they use for one another. So it was very, the first draft was very personal and very autobiographical and, uh, um, and, and not nearly as good as what came out at the end. Uh, you know, there's a, a scene toward the end of the novel where um, Jake sits down, I think with uh, uh, Bill uh, and, um, he, he makes a comment like, uh, uh, to the effect, um, it, it felt like there were six people missing. Uh, and I think that's, that's a great way of talking about the thing that's left out in the novel there. Uh, Kirk mentioned that Hadley is in fact named in, in the early you know, notebook version uh, of this novel that Hemingway started writing uh, in hotels right after Pamplona was over. Uh, and Hadley was part of the novel, but she very soon disappeared. 
And that raises, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, uh, factoid when, when you're thinking about the dynamics of the novel and the relationship between the narrator and Brett Ashley. And of course, Hemingway did have a crush on Brett on Duff Twisden, which Hadley, I'm sure, was very aware of uh, in Pamplona. But what's interesting about the disappearance of Hadley is that during the course of writing this novel from the summer of 1925 until the early spring of 1926, she was going out of his life. So this is a real prefiguration uh, of a personnel change at home. Uh, there's a very brief reference early in the novel to uh, uh, one of uh, Kitty Cannell's friends, which was Pauline. It's called, she's called Paula in the novel. So here's Hemingway kind of prefiguring uh, in a weird way uh, what's going to happen in, in his own life. But it's, it's completely irrelevant to the uh, uh, the action of the sun also rises, uh, but but nevertheless, um, the Hemingway's the value of of using uh, personal experience. I think for Hemingway is is embedded in the the concrete details of place. He was absolutely um, uh, preoccupied with getting the details right, going back, checking the streets, all of those walks around Paris all of the details about Pamplona, all of the bullfighters. So uh, he, he, uh, he was absolutely uh, uh, fixated on getting the details right. He did it when he was writing The Sun Also Rises, and he did it again in 1959 and 1960 when he was writing The Dangerous Summer and going back to Spain and still writing about bullfighting and needing to go back to make sure he had every single fact exactly right. Well, I think Jerry brings up some really interesting biographical points there. You know, that winter of 1925-26, when he's revising uh, The Sun Also Rises at the Hotel Tauba in Schruns, Austria, yeah. Hadley had invited one of her close friends, Pauline, to come spend a few weeks with them. Uh, skiing and celebrating, and she came. Big mistake. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was the beginning of their romance that, that blossomed as the spring went along. But and, just to, um, j oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. I, I was just going to say, just to give you another example of how I think he heightens the inventive quality or the literariness, the symbolism. You know, originally, I believe the a uh, young bullfighter in the novel was Nino, Nino De Palma. Is that right? Yeah. Um, um, and he later changed it, taking Pedro Romero, who was a mythical sort of a, you know, a, 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 an epic figure in Spanish history and giving his young bullfighter that name. So that's an example, I think, of that reverse process where, you know, he, he, he's very carefully, um, you know, uh, improvising on top of lived experience and heightening the uh, symbolic Im import. Yeah, and that took some research because Pedro Romero fought in the late 18th century. Right, right. So yeah. Hemingway would have learned that at Ronda, where they have a vivid uh, kind of recollection or still a, a tribute to Pedro Romero. Nina de la Palma's son was part of our Hemingway conference in uh, uh, Pamplona later on. I was on a panel with him, actually, and I didn't know what to expect from him. I was thinking, you know, what is a bullfighter uh, like? And I thought probably a little bit like an American football player or something like that. Well, when he opened his remarks, he said Hemingway had an, an, uh, a perfect instinct for the nuance, nuances of tone used to describe the bullfight. And I thought, not a football player. <laughs> uh, he, was, he was great. He talked a lot about uh, Hemingway and how much, uh, how intimately he was involved with the lives of his, uh, the bullfighters at that time. And especially I've, with his father. I've always thought one of the great 
sort of losses about understanding that period was the fact that Duff Twisden passed away from tuberculosis in the late 30s, whereas Harold Bloom and Kitty Cannell and many other folks that were in that circle who and Bill Smith, you know, they became sort of minor celebrities themselves in the 60s and early 70s in their, you know, in many cases where they were in their 70s. The uh, even into their 80s, where they were invited to conferences and they would get to come and speak about what it was like to be transmogrified into these uh, into these characters. And you know, think about Harold uh, Harold Loeb, who had uh, you know started out as an ambitious writer, and and you know after a few novels disappeared into a economics career. Uh, government worked for the government for decades. Uh, and then all of a sudden in his in his uh, elder years uh, comes back out and is one of the last living touchstones to uh, to the, to that novel. So it's a it's a you know, the idea that we're in that that famous characters make real life people famous, um, you know, it's just part of the interesting background. And, and it and it gives these people sort of a fame that they probably would not have had on their own. Uh, Hemingway was humorously inventive when talking about the lives of, the, of his friends and the people he knew. For example, with Duff Twisden, he told all of his friends that she had uh, drunk herself to death and that at her funeral, all of the pallbearers were former uh, lovers of hers. And then, of course, the reality was uh, she died of, what was it, tuberculosis? Yeah. yeah, and he was cremated. There weren't any pallbearers. <laughs> that sort of thing comes up with Hemingway all the time. It's part of the fun of studying his life in relationship to his works. Thank you. I'm going to go to the third question. And by the way, I encourage people to put more in. Um, from Gregory Bloomquist. Uh, Fitzgerald's This Side of Paradise has most of these themes. No, and you, I've already heard you mention this. Again, I'm going to push this. We will assume that it does have a certain number of the same themes, and you could elaborate that. Uh, which, where does Hemingway treat them better, you know, and how? Uh, and and you know, where does Fitzgerald treat them better? We'll presume they each have individual excellences. I mean, can you say when they treat of the same subject matter, which treats on which is better at what? Yeah. Well, Fitzgerald, you know, published This Side of Paradise when he was 23 years old, and it reads like a book by a 23 year old. I mean, it's one of those great youth culture novels that inaugurates a fad, but in some sense doesn't outlive the fad itself. And that's not the case with This Side of Paradise. I think, you know, you could be reductive and say that what Fitzgerald did was take the theme of the rising generation or the younger generation, it was as it was sometimes called, and Hemingway turned it into the theme of the lost generation, which is a little more imprecise, a little more universal. Uh, one of the things that's always struck me about this side of paradise is all of these characters are about 34 years old, which back in the 1920s was bordering upon middle age. Um, they are not the young collegiate crowd that Fitzgerald often wrote about. Um, and I think Fitzgerald himself, at least in his novels, tried to pivot away from that identification with youth culture uh, in The Great Gatsby when he has Nick Carraway unceremoniously stand up and announce, today's my 30th birthday, and it's all downhill from here. Um, I think Hemingway never really bought into the idea of, uh, of youth. He often criticized Fitzgerald for being so obsessed with youth, uh, called it a whiny little devil's dance that he was trapped in and tender as the night. But I also think Hemingway denied the fact that he wanted to be a generational spokesman, at least in this period of time. And um, so I think, you know, I think Hemingway... I think Fitzgerald himself had outgrown that theme by 1925 when he uh, was meeting Hemingway. But I think Hemingway himself envisioned this idea of a lost generation, not tied to maturation, but more tied with adult stability and the availability of institutions and traditions like faith and marriage and, um, and, and professions. Yeah. You know, uh, the, I would connect uh, Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises more directly uh, 
uh, to the great Gatsby. Um, I mean, uh, Hemingway had just met Fitzgerald a matter of weeks before he went off to Pamplona. Uh, they met in, in uh, maybe at, at the end of April in 1925, and the great Gatsby came out April 10th, 1925. So you know that Hemingway read the great Gatsby uh, that summer uh, just before he went to Pamplona. I mean, I don't, maybe there is a smoking gun somewhere, but uh, I just have to assume uh, since he was hanging out with Fitzgerald in Paris that he got a hold of The Sun Also Rises at Sylvia Beaches and read it. There you get a, a, a really interesting narrative approach, a, a narrator who seems to be projecting the spectatorial view and calling attention to other people around him so that we're inclined not to see Nick Carraway as the central figure of the novel. And I think Hemingway picks that up and does some really interesting things with the way that, you know, from the very first sentence, Hemingway is asking us to look at somebody else, to think about Robert Cohn. And what we don't get until we're, you know, a ways into the novel is any intimation uh, of all of the psychological baggage that Jake is carrying as a result of his war wound and his relationship with Brett that can never be consummated now. Uh, and uh, I, I really feel as if that uh, is uh, uh, connected to his reading of Fitzgerald. They also met at the Dingo yeah. Bar. Uh, right. which is a central scene, you know, a central location in The That's Sun right. Also Rises. That's right. It is interesting that when he completed uh, the writing of The Sun Also Rises, he sent the manuscript to Fitzgerald. For right. And <laughs> who, Fitzgerald who played a huge it, influence on it. And, uh, it uh, uh, liked it uh, very much, but he said... I think the first two chapters should be deleted. They're unnecessary. They're, you explain too much about the background of these characters. It's better to start in the middle of the action. And next to that uh, sentence in the, in the letter he wrote to Hemingway, Hemingway had written, you can kiss my rear end, I'll, I'll say. And then he did exactly what Fitzgerald suggested. That's right. Absolutely. And that was great advice because the the opening chapters were a very, you know, gossipy description of the Mon, the Montparnasse quarter. Yeah. And yeah. a kind of a, a, a long rant about gays. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of that, that remains in the novel in the dance hall scene, but uh uh it didn't need to be there. And, uh, and the great irony is the great Gatsby is not exactly known for an opening kind of blow your socks off type of opening. I mean, it's yeah. it's an opening that takes a while to get to its first scene as well. So I yeah. think, uh, you know, Fitzgerald was was maybe a little bit more perceptive of a reader of of Hemingway's manuscript than of his own. Uh, yeah. Maybe we should say for people who haven't uh, read the manuscripts that when Hemingway first wrote the novel, the opening Paris section was not in there. The novel opened in Spain yeah. and the central character was the bullfighter. So all the, the entire first section uh, was added later. Now that, that Paris section is really crucial because that's where it is revealed that Jake was wounded in the war, that he has an impossible relationship with Brett, that he condescends to Robert Cohn, a lot of the values that are going to be important when you get to Pamplona are introduced in that early Paris section. Right. And that was added later. Yeah. Including Count Mepopopoulos, mm -hmm. who, who underlines knowing the values. Yeah. Yes, and the wound, because he's got the arrow wounds from right, the war right. that he was part Lifts of. up his shirt. Yeah. <laughs> This is perhaps a, too obvious a comparison, but you know, Lady Chatterley's lover, uh, was there any consciousness uh, influence one way or the other for that? 
you know, mm-hmm. being wounded in a war, sexual problems, right. a more or less sympathetic attitude towards the person who suffers them. Uh, I'm not aware of Hemingway having read uh, Lady Chatter's Lover. I think Lady Chatter's Lover uh, uh, comes later, if I remember right, a couple, yeah, a few I years later right. after yeah. after the uh, the sun also rises. Had had Hemingway read it, I think he would probably, you know, he, for all that we think of as Hemingway with being loose with the f bombs and being <laughs> as vulgar as he can be. Uh, you know, maybe in personal discourse, uh, he could be kind of a prude when he when it came to the to the writing. Now, certainly the audience didn't think of it that way. And one of the great one of the greatest things ever about the Sun Os Rises is the letter that his mother sends him, uh, where she clips out a negative review of the the novel and sends it to him and basically rakes him over the coals saying is there no other words that you can take joy in other than damn and bitch? And, um, you know, it's a, it really makes you empathize with Hemingway's uh, anger toward his mother, which is legendary. But I think, you know, Hemingway probably would have looked at uh, Lawrence and probably felt he was too Freudian. I mean, there's a, there's a great exchange between Bill Gordon and, and uh, Jake on the train ride where they, talk about, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln had the hots for uh, General Lee and, um, you know, uh, the whole reason that we are, that America has fallen is because it's sex obsessed. And that's clearly a reductive sort of uh, parody of Freud. So I think he probably would have uh, found um, Lawrence a little too explicit. I mean, Lady Shadow Lover still has the power to shock. I mean, if you if you go back in there and you read that. Hemingway's reading was largely in the French authors and also r- Russian authors. Uh, now, er- everybody quotes the comment he made that all American literature starts with Huckleberry Finn. Well, Hemingway probably thought that because he'd read so little or l- <laughs> earlier uh, American literature. It was not part of the r- curriculum in high school and he didn't go to college, of course. Uh, so there were uh, vast areas of American fiction that he was unaware of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll say I was just looking this up. Lady Chatterley's Lover, 1928. Somehow I remembered that as 1923 for my sins. I, I'm going to go to a question on teaching, which is always fun. Um, how have student in your talk let us say you're teaching college undergraduates how much knowledge do they have about Hemingway coming in and that's a question from the beginning of your teaching career through now and how have you had to differ in the way you teach Hemingway for a different audience as you know the students get farther and farther removed from the 1920s Well, I can say something about that. I think the big problem in uh, teaching Hemingway is the magazine Hemingway. That is the magazine cover Hemingway as a a great hunter and a fighter and a drinker and a womanizer. And that's the image uh, that undergraduates bring to the Sun Also Rises, if if in fact this is the first of the the Hemingway novels that they've read, which it often, often is. Uh, They don't think of Hemingway as a disciplined writer, which, of course, is what he was. His secretary detailed what an average day would be like of Hemingway getting up about six o'clock in the morning and uh, uh, getting a cup of coffee and going up to his desk and working hard until about 11 o'clock, sometimes noon. And then he was through for the day. But in all those hours he'd be lucky to get two pages of a new novel written. He'd do things over and over again. And uh, he were, fiction for Hemingway was a labored art. It didn't come easily. He worked very hard at it. It obviously meant everything to him. And it's part of his greatness is uh, how fine he was at revision. Uh, 
I think uh, the, the question of how students come to Hemingway, what they know about him, uh, can be put in a, a historical context. Uh, there, is a, there is a perception of Hemingway before the mid 80s, and there, then a perception that grew out of uh, the, the Kenneth Lynn biography and the publication of the Garden of Eden, uh, and the revelation of a side of Hemingway that people did not perceive earlier, which is the, the Hemingway uh, with a very serious interest in androgyny, uh, in lesbianism and homosexuality, in gender crossing. And, um, um, you know, there are many, many feminist scholars now who work on Hemingway, uh, and I think rightly so. It, it, somebody said to me yesterday uh, that, um, uh, you know, uh, they had the impression that Hemingway must be a sexist, and then read The Sun Also Rises and saw in Brett Ashley, a remarkably independent woman who lives her life the way she wants to and doesn't suffer anything from anybody. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to teach Hemingway these days. And um, I have to confess that most of the times I taught The Sun Also Rises uh, during my career, I taught it in Paris uh, in a summer study program that I started there in 1981. Uh, this was long before I wrote Imagining Paris, uh, but that book really came out of the experience of walking the streets, exactly the walks that Jake Barnes takes uh, at the beginning of The Sun Also Rises. And it was incredible to see students uh, take a serious invested interest uh, in Hemingway's friends, uh, seeing where Gertrude Stein lived, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, one of my students uh, kind of took up the habit of writing his journal in cafes. It was the only place he could work, he said. And then one week he just disappeared from class. And I said, where's Colin? And somebody said, oh, he's gone to Pamplona. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Michigan, and if you were at all a young man um, 45 years ago or so and were in Michigan had any kind of literary interest, you were pretty much obliged to be kind of a faux Hemingway and go out in the woods. And it, But I will tell you that this novel inspired in me a, a, a tremendous desire to travel at that age. And I, uh, you know, thanks to reading The Sun Also Rises, I left home at 16 and was a graduate student or a uh, 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 exchange student, excuse me, in Brazil. And, you know, very self-consciously, you, you know, not maybe not so much in drinking, but maybe a little bit in that way, modeled myself on those uh, types of characters, searching for those experiences. And I had thought that might have died out just a little bit over the course of my career, but I had the uh, opportunity three years ago to take some students uh, to Italy. And after that, we went back through Paris. And, um, you know, they had that same experience that Jerry was talking about, where they had they were going around with copies of it and finding the exact locations. And it's very gratifying to me because one of those young women has since got a job in Pamplona. And she she wrote an article for the little uh, Hemingway newsletter that we put out for the society talking about teaching in you know, Hemingway City and what it was like to sort of go there and to sort of, on the one hand, be holding down a job, but also be aware that she was kind of enjoying that Brett Ashley experience of, of being independent and discovering and, and going out into the world in the way that, you know, Puritan American, uh, Puritanical America would probably disapprove of. So I think the appeal of travel still uh, exists. And you cannot go anywhere where Hemingway set a novel or lived or a short story and not have that, that, that aura of Hemingway there. And there's really not that many writers that that's true of. Um, Jerry made some very interesting points about Hemingway and sexuality. 
And my wife and I spent a, a couple of weeks with uh, Gregory and his wife uh, one summer. And uh, maybe the audience doesn't know that Gregory Hemingway, Hemingway's third son, died as Gloria Hemingway. He went. He was a transsexual. He was. He had a sex change operation. When we were with them, he was sort of in the middle of that. He would paint his fingernails, for example, and he was developing breasts, and I think he was on hormone treatment at that uh, juncture. But Hemingway certainly lived in a world in which those kinds of things were possible. Yeah, you know, Gregory came to the conference in Paris in 1994, and I'll never forget it. The very first thing he said to me when we shook hands was, you know, my father hated my guts. Mm -hmm. And he was convinced that his father wanted a daughter. And that was sort of the ide fix for his life to become that daughter. Although he, he was, you know, by all accounts, including I was working this morning with uh, Valerie Hemingway here in Austin, Texas on a Hemingway letters project. And of course, uh, she was married to Gregory for something like 18, 20 years and had uh, three children with him. And uh, she says, how, you know, what a loving husband he was and a caring father. Uh, and uh, so we get another view of, of uh, Gregory from her. Well, but, but also <clears throat> duplicitous in an uncomfortable way because during the early years of their marriage, he was already married to somebody else. Yeah, well, there's that. Yeah, <laughs> he had to get a divorce, and they had to go to Mexico and get married all over again for it to be legal. Details, uh, details. It's, all, very, it's always complicated. complicated. <laughs> uh, the, 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 part of the uh, interesting uh, world of being a Hemingway scholar in the 20th century was that Hemingway's sons were all alive and often participated in these events, and they had insights into things. I was, I was quite a good friend with Jack Hemingway. Uh, he would come stay with me in Boston, and we'd play tennis every day, and I went out and stayed for a couple of weeks with him in Sun Valley. We went together to Pamplona for the bullfights and the fiesta, and he would talk about what Papa had told him about all of that. Uh, and uh, he taught me a lot about, uh, he knew much more about bullfighting than I did. And um, I don't particularly like bullfighting. Uh, it seems not much of a contest. It's a sacrifice uh, from my point of view. But uh, in any event, um, uh, it was fascinating to uh, get to know Hemingway's three sons and hear about their reflections with their father. Jack, of course, had the best relationship with Papa of the three boys. Gregory was very complicated. Um, and um, of course, he was uh, thrown in jail at one point for cross-dressing. And uh, uh, his crime was that you're not supposed to be in the ladies' uh, bathroom if, uh, if you have male genitalia. And he was arrested for that. Well, from the uh, perspective of the letters that we are working through, 1957 to 61, uh, Hemingway did have some problems with Jack, with Bumby, uh, especially the woman that he was married to at that time. Uh, and he he uh, and was was uh, I think probably uh, his middle son Patrick. Uh, shows up in the letters as the one who is steady, the one who can be counted on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And of course, he went off to Africa and got into big game hunting. <laughs> well, Jack flunked out of Dartmouth twice, which is very difficult to do if your last name is Hemingway. <laughs> uh, Patrick, on the other hand, was, was a brilliant student at Harvard and yeah. probably would have gone on to take a PhD if his mother had not died in 1951. Yeah. when Patrick was in the middle of graduate school and he dropped out of the program at that point and never went back. Uh, it was too bad because Gregory, uh, Patrick was very bright and uh, very interesting. And uh, uh, 
far beyond uh, Jack. Jack was a very nice guy and a good buddy uh, to hang out with and play sports with and so forth, but he was nothing of a, a literary scholar or a student. I remember staying with Jack at his house and he was showing me his library and he said whenever Papa would publish a book, he'd send me a copy of it. And I said, really, that's great. He said, and Jack said, yeah, I'd sit down and read it all through right away. I said, well, that, that would really keep you current on things. Then later I picked up a couple of those volumes and looked at them. The pages had not been cut. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, I think I'm going to uh, get our uh, wonderful session, I think, to an end because it is 3.30. I could sit on listening for a while, but the audience has, I think, places to go to ultimately. Thank you all so very much. It's wonderful listening, wonderful learning. Uh, let me just do a little bit of closing stuff to say. So thank you to the audience, all for you. Couldn't be done without you. Thank you to our participants. Um, I want to encourage anybody who liked this to join the National Association of Scholars. I will advertise the fact that we have more of these webinars coming up soon in the coming week. You know, the Great American Literature Series will continue. I believe our next one is the Fall of the House of Usher one week from now. Mm. That'll be fun. <laughs> um, and again, if you have questions unanswered, send them to me, David Randall, randall at nas.org. I'll be delighted to forward them to our panelists so that they can have the option to respond to you. And um, if you want to watch this again, uh, share it with your friends. It will be on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours. All right, that was all hasty and all, but uh, thank you all so very much. It's been wonderful. Can thank I add a little something for my two colleagues? Sure. Yes. I've been retired now for a decade, and I just wanted to say what a delight it was to be on a program with Jerry and Kirk and to have an intelligent discussion of these things. Uh, those are precious moments. And if you spend your life teaching in a university, you live in that world all the time. Boy, when you're retired and it goes away, you miss it tremendously. So I very much enjoyed uh, being with you two guys and thank you for letting me be part of this. Ditto. I feel Lovely. the same.